Good morning, colleagues. Could we ask you to take your seats, please? We're about to begin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Those who are slaves are on the platform. Could they come up to the stage, please? Could I now call on the EI President, Susan Hopgood, to open the proceedings. Good morning and welcome. Before I begin, I'd like to first of all thank Tony Lake and UNICEF for their generosity in hosting this event and for being such a consistent and reliable friend of educators everywhere. Colleagues, a little more than one year ago, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, on the subject of education, aimed his sights higher than the Millennium Development Goals. He said, every child must be in school. The quality of those schools must improve. And all children must be prepared as productive citizens ready to lead the future. At Education International, 30 million teachers in more than 170 countries around the world, we have engaged in a decades-long advocacy of education for all. Now we are aiming higher as well. We are today launching a global campaign, Unite for Quality Education, to bring our members and their communities and partners and nations together in pursuit of better quality education for a better world. For our members, that pursuit of a quality education for students began from the earliest days of their careers, as it did for me. As a maths teacher in secondary school, it came when my students' eyes lit up with an understanding of complex subjects. And this is exactly the sort of inspiration that moves educators around the world every day to prepare and perform as professionals, to find and use the best tools and resources available to give their students the skills to build their futures and to advocate for safe and supportive environments for teaching and learning. Most of all, it inspires and motivates teachers in our work and through our organisations to be the leading advocates for access to quality, and let me stress, quality education in every corner of the globe. Quality education is not simply a public good. It is a basic human right. 60 years ago this December, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights recognised the transformative role of a quality education beyond letters and numbers. It said, education shall be directed to the full development of the human personality and to the strengthening of respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. It shall promote understanding tolerance and friendship among all nations, racial or religious groups, and the maintenance of peace. These words, colleagues, matter. Our vision of quality education is not only defined in terms of learning outcomes, but also in terms of the full development of the individual and their contribution to society. Our commitment to quality education has never wavered. We believe that a better quality education is a key to a better world. And we know the components of a better quality education, leading our young people from poverty to participation and leadership for sus sustainable development requires quality teachers, quality tools and resources and quality learning environments. Today, quality education for all remains a dream for millions of young people. More than 67 million children of primary school age, and 71 million adolescents are out of school, while 775 million adults, two-thirds of them women, remain illiterate. We are still more than five million teachers short of what we need to achieve the goal of universal primary education by 2015. No organisations have fought as hard as those representing educators for the resources and tools and proper environments for teaching and learning 
and to professionalise the teaching core. With regard to the Millennium Development Goals and Education for All, the position of Education International has always been clear. Education for all means quality education for all. We know that quality matters. It cannot be a luxury for the few. It's a necessity for every student. Study after study shows the world that education is the stone in the pond. The ripples it causes disrupt the status quo. When parents have more education, they have healthier children. Families are better able to cope with fluctuations of income. But what is quality education? We know what access to education means, and we've seen that it can be meaningless without a connection to quality. We believe that quality education is based on three pillars. Quality teaching, quality tools for teaching and learning, and quality teaching and learning environments at all levels of education in all communities. Quality teaching will be achieved when all students are being taught by teachers with comprehensive teacher education, supported by continuous professional development. Quality tools to aid teaching and learning should be available in particular through the application of information and communication technology. That is, by harnessing the enormous power of the internet and modern technology to assist and support teaching and learning. It also means a meaningful and engaging <coughs> curriculum that is contextually relevant. Finally, quality learning environments are safe and supportive with the professional support services and appropriate facilities to encourage student learning and to enable teachers to teach effectively. To change the reality for millions of students, we must have an impact on perceptions around the world. And so we are mobilising. Education International is committed to an unprecedented effort to share the experience of quality teaching and professional educators striving to provide quality education. We are highlighting successes, raising the vis visibility of models of potential success and demanding policies that lead to future success. At the recent regional conference of our 76 member organisations in the Asia Pacific, each organisation signed a pledge, a written pledge of support for our campaign. At the Latin American conference two weeks ago, 40 organisations in every single country in Latin America pledged to hold specific activities to put quality education at the top of national and international agendas. We will be inviting our member organisations in every part of the world to pledge their support in the coming days. The organisations from New Zealand commissioned this talking stick known as Toko Toko, which in the Maori culture means a sentinel, sentinel, something carrying a message. The Toko Toko represents the transmission of learning that is at the heart of quality public education. It has carvings on it, representing the four winds, because it will be travelling across this world this year, passed around from different countries and events by education unions before returning ultimately to Aotearoa, New Zealand. I hold it before you to symbolise the fact that I speak representing the collective strength of 30 million educators from all over the globe to demand quality education for all. In this Unite for Quality Education campaign, we will bring together the voices of EIM member organisations and others who know that a better quality education is a key to a better world. Our aim is to create awareness among governments, intergovernmental agencies and society generally that quality education for all is a central part of any global post-2015 development strategy. We will highlight successful educational practices and activities and seek support for them, making them available for all. We will emphasise the role of professional teachers and the need to support them with modern teaching and learning tools, professional support staff and quality learning environments. And we will seek the support of other partner organisations committed to this vision of quality education for all. 
colleagues, we are engaging in this campaign with our eyes wide open. We know there are elements of the public and private sectors that would prefer teachers not engage in education policy or the political process by which policy is set. And some of these same elements are interested in nothing less than eliminating public education and mining these public resources for private profit. We will not retreat. I want to make that very clear. <coughs> we will challenge those who promote such views. Indeed, we will take advantage of every opportunity to state the facts about the critical importance of teachers in education and of public education as a public good and a right for every student. In 2005, the world decided that the new millennium deserved so ambitious goals, among them universal primary education. We knew then what Nelson Mandela said so eloquently, that education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. In 2013, we still have a chance to meet those goals. But in these next two years, we have an even greater opportunity to go beyond ambitious, to be bold, to challenge ourselves outside the bounds of, of traditional alliances, to recognise that working together, if we will have the power to change the world. We start here with our worldly body, working to manifest in policy what teachers see in their classrooms, what parents dream for their children, and what students know is their path to participation as global citizens. I'm here to say with all my heart, the educators of the world are more than ready to lead this campaign for quality education for all. And so today, we begin the campaign. A better education for a better world. Let us unite for quality education. I'd like now to introduce to you Dr. Kishaw Singh. We are very pleased to have him here today. Dr. Singh was responsible for the right to education at UNESCO for many years and is now the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Education. I ask Dr. Singh to address you. President of uh, International Education, Mrs. Suzanne Hofgood, uh, Education International Community, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. I would like, first of all, to thank the Education International for inviting me to participate in the launch of Unite for Quality Education, Better Education for a Better World campaign today, on the occasion of World Teachers Day. I would like also to thank UNICEF for hosting the event. The initiative by Education International is commendable in face of challenges of achieving the fundamental right of every boy and girl for quality education as an entitlement. Giving the call for uniting for quality education is most timely when international communities today engage in discussions on post-2015 development agenda. It is also opportune as a follow-up to the International Expert Conference Vienna Plus 2, Vienna Plus 20, sorry, which was organized on the occasion of 20 years of the Declaration and Program of Action for Human Rights adapted in Vienna in 1993. And I say this especially to underline the fact that at this conference, the important role of civil society organizations and stakeholders was given very high importance. We know the dearth of qualified teachers has been an impediment in achieving the education for all goals as well as education related millennium development goals. Shortage of qualified teachers, which has assumed Alarming proportions is a matter of concern for all of us, as President Suzanne Hofgood also just now mentioned. It is incumbent upon public authorities to take bold measures 
with innovative programs for revamping teaching profession and education. Challenges are in fact daunting, not only to ensure that qualified teachers are deployed, but also to devise new modalities of education and teaching and training in tandem with the ongoing reforms necessary in the field of education. Teaching and imparting knowledge and skills, which is a noble profession, does not enjoy the social esteem it deserves. It is often least sought after, whereas it should be a coveted career. And therefore, it is very important to valorize teaching profession with due regard to it as a form of public service. In the context of ongoing discussions on shaping the future agenda for education, a strong focus on quality education is of paramount importance. This should be central concern in development agenda and national implementation strategies should premium on this. Well qualified teachers are essential requirements of any quality standards. No efforts for quality education can succeed without qualified and committed teaching profession. Universally recognized human rights and democratic principles should be embedded in education, in any education system, as I outlined in my report to the Human Rights Council, submitted in June 2012. Quality considerations have wider connotation. We all must recognize the crucial need of education for global citizenship which is one of the key objectives of Secretary General's initiative, Global Initiative Education First, launched in September 2012. Furthermore, pursuant to the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 6718, adopted last year on education and democracy, there is also need to put emphasis on democratic education along with civic education and integrate this into national policies and standards. I will, be, I will very soon be presenting my report on the right to education and the post-2000 development agenda to the United Nations General Assembly in which I will address many of these concerns and issues. Global advocacy and campaign are highly significant to raise public debate on such emerging concerns and challenges. I hope very much that today's launch will result in a global movement in fostering comprehensive policy measures to quality imperatives and teacher education challenges in future. We must indeed sharpen our focus on quality education so as to bring it to the forefront in the concerns and actions of global partnerships and children, adults, and youth must be unable to acquire necessary knowledge, skills, and competencies to aspire for a better, promising future. I look forward to our continued collaboration in the pursuit of the right to quality education as a without discrimination or exclusion as a fundamental human right for the benefit of present and the future generations. Thank you. And thank you very much, Dr. Singh, for your uh, for your support for our for our campaign. The Unite for Quality Education campaign has an ambitious goal. We want to pull together the voices of educators around the world and raise those voices to become part of the dialogue about the future of development and international policy. Communications are critical, and we are committed to develop modern media tools to get the message out. The most important of these platforms is the campaign website or hub. I would now like to invite Dennis Van Rokel, NEA President and EI Vice President for North America and the Caribbean to give his perspective on quality education and our present campaign hub. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Susan. It is an honor to be here as a representative of not only the National Education Association, but also our colleagues in the American Federation of Teachers. Because all of us here in the United States, we too want to be 
an active participant in this incredible effort. Because we share the commitment with EI and all of our colleagues in EI about the importance of a quality education for every single child in this world. And as governments and intergovernmental organizations, international financial institutions, as they all start looking at the 2015 deadline on the Millennium Development Goals as well as Education for All, we all believe together that we can make a difference with this campaign. We are very much committed to universal, free, quality education with access to quality teachers for every student. We want modern tools and resources available to those educators so they can educate children to the best of their ability. And we want supportive, safe, and secure environments for teaching and learning. We all believe that education is not a luxury, but it is an absolute human right and every child in the world deserves it. For parents, whether you're in New York City or New Delhi, India, you believe, as parents, how important it is that your child receive an education. And I believe that if we achieve these goals, we will have come a long way to establishing peace and prosperity. And I know teachers around the world believe it. I'm always amazed by the passion and the commitment whether I'm visiting a classroom in the United States or anywhere in the world, the commitment to make a difference in the lives of students and their belief that education can not only change the lives of an individual, but it can transform families, communities, and nations. And although that passion and commitment is powerful, too often it's not heard. Those educators, the teachers and education professionals, their voices seem seem to be drowned out by others. So for this next year, we want to make sure that teachers raise their voices. We want to tell the world about the important work they do. We want to bring their successes, their hopes, the challenges they have each and every day. And we want to showcase these educators and show it to the entire world. One of the ways we're going to do that is to uh, have a special website as what's mentioned, uniteforeducation.org. And that is where we will showcase these educators and all of their hopes and dreams so that all the world can do, can see. But not only is EI doing the website, they're also pr producing a documentary video, a day in the life of a teacher. And it's traveling all over the world to see what is the life like through the eyes of a teacher. Let me show you a brief intro to that video. I felt very happy to be a teacher when my students, they can graduate from the school. The art and the culture is very important in school also because they can make themselves in balance. To have a good quality of education if the teacher themselves must be, must be good. Une école de rêve, c'est une école de qualité. Je pense qu'il y a des défis à relever pour avoir une école de qualité. Si l'État cautionne et supporte, améliore l'éducation, c'est des vies aussi qui sont améliorées. C'est la société aussi qui est protégée. L'éducation, c'est un droit humain, c'est un droit social. Si on, on, on apporte une solution aux, aux défis infrastructurels, une solution aux défis structurels, une solution aux défis personnels, Quoi de mieux On aurait l'idéal, presque l'idéal. Mais je pense que nous avons des rêves à notre école, nous pensons que nous avons des facilités dans notre école. 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 We feel quality has been diluted. 
in the race to include everybody in the field of education. There are 100 kids in my school, good. But how many of the 100 kids are actually getting education should also be the parameter. Boa parte dos nossos alunos, eles, eles residem na, no campo, na zona rural. E eles têm uma certa dificuldade de transporte, né? Nosso trabalho, né? Muitas vezes tende a preparar uma pessoa para o mercado de trabalho na cidade. Seria interessante também colocar nesse currículo, nessa pedagogia educacional, fatos de trabalho na zona rural, no mundo da zona rural também. Porque é o mundo deles. Aqui como um corpo humano, né, onde está mais doente e precisa ser mais bem tratado, né? Eu acredito, com certeza, que a escola né, que tem mais carência tem que investir mais, né? Tem que ser trabalhado mais, né? Through the eyes of educators, despite way too large of classes. Through the eyes of educators every day, they see the eagerness in the eyes of the learners, the passion for learning. And for NEA, we want to be, do our part in this project. And we want to be part of a place where we understand that this will make a difference. Because no matter where you go in this world, whether it's the United States or any other country, there are students everywhere who are not in school. Millions of students who have never set foot in a classroom. We need to change that. And it's time for us to get beyond just fighting all the bad ideas and those who are attacking us. We need to do that, yes. But we need to do more, and that is for our voices to be heard to say, this is what ought to be done instead. This is what will change the lives of students. And we need to challenge governments and international monetary organizations. We need to challenge them to say, if you want this too, then raise your hand. Commit to making a difference in this world. It is not right to accept nor tolerate the conditions we allow for children all across this great world of ours. So please visit EI's website, uniteforeducation.org. Or come to NEA's website, nea.org slash raise your hand. For education, just imagine what 30 million educators in 170 countries and all of the other organizations who believe what should be for children, if we unite for quality education, we can make a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. Um, I would like to now introduce Kwame Atompong from the Global Monitoring Report. The Education for All Global Monitoring Report is the authority on our progress towards achieving our global goals. EI is proud to sit on the steering committee of the Global Monitoring Report and excited that this year's report will have a special section on teaching and learning. Kwame is here to give us a preview of this year's report and we want to thank him and the entire Global Monitoring uh, Report team for partnering with us and informing our campaign. I invo invite Kwame to address us. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests, good morning. I bring you greetings from the GMR team, a uh, team that has been dedicated to providing us with some of the most important information we need to have uh, to know about what uh, the status of education is globally. And as has just been mentioned, we are currently completing the report for the 2013-2014 year, which is going to be on teachers, uh, teaching and learning for development. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, as I stand before you today, there is a global learning crisis. The scale of the challenge is immense. As our last <laughs> Education for All Global Monitoring Report showed, there are 250 million children not learning the basics. Around half of those not learning the basics have even spent at least four years in school. For us, this is 
a modern day tragedy, that children would be in school for four years and not learn the basics. But this is the hard reality. The failure of policymakers to tackle the crisis in the quality of education is leaving behind those who are the most disadvantaged due to circumstances at birth, whether they are gender, poverty, where they live, or whether they have a disability. In fact, this is the group which is the hardest to reach, and this is the group which needs our utmost attention. A first step to tackling this learning crisis is to address the crippling shortage of teachers. This is something that we've recognized and has been highlighted this morning many of whom have not been offered the essential training to provide the quality education our children so desperately need. So teachers are the center of this uh, uh, issue. Today, World Teachers Day should act as a wake up call to policymakers around the world to put teachers at the heart of overcoming this global learning crisis. If we are going to solve this problem, we have to place the teacher at the center of our solution and of our strategies. And we recognize that this is the time for us to, to, to speak out for teachers uh, and for policymakers to take note of the, of the role that teachers play in securing quality education for all. Without the advantage of literacy, our recently released evidence on the transformational power of education shows that they will also be less likely to have healthy children, to find well-paid work, challenge cultural prejudices, participate in democracy, and propel their own families and their societies forward into greater prosperity. As we work on our, our next report, we have been in touch with so many teachers. And some of them have shared with us their aspirations and their thinking about what makes a good teacher. Anna, a teacher from Peru, who, who we have been in touch with for the forthcoming report, explains how the importance of education has motivated her to become a teacher. She told us, I chose to be a teacher because I believe that education has the power to transform the society we live in. What motivates me to be a good teacher is to be an active agent in this change that is so necessary for my country to fight against discrimination, injustice, racism, corruption, and poverty. Many of the teachers we've spoken to have expressed a very strong desire to be change agents in their countries. And I think this is something that we need to bring to the attention of governments, of policymakers. Teachers are ready for, for the change. They are ready to address the problem of global learning. To learn, you need to be taught. Yes, every child most certainly needs a teacher. Teachers are the backbone of a well-functioning quality education system. But there is a, sh a, a huge shortage of professional, well-trained, and well-supported teachers for today's world. New figures from UNESCO released today show that around half of countries around the world do not have enough teachers in the classrooms to achieve universal primary education by 2015. About half of countries do not have enough teachers to, to achieve this goal by 2015. An extra 1.6 million teachers are needed globally to achieve universal primary education by 2015. The case is put simply by a teacher we have been in contact with for our next report, Mubarak, from the Punjab in Pakistan. This is what he has to say. We have a shortage of teachers. With these numbers, the teacher cannot give attention to every student. If the government collaborates and gives us more teachers, he says, we can ensure a much higher level of students' achievement. Teachers are also concerned about quality education. And they, they tell us that they they are ready for the task, they are ready to, uh, uh, to, to contribute to improving the quality of education, but we need to provide more teachers to make this a reality. Currently, however, Pakistan is amongst a list of countries who aren't expected to fill the teacher gap, even by 2030. We have less than 850 days to go until the 2015 deadline, when universal lower secondary schooling is expected is widely expected to form part of a new global of new global goals. Yet to achieve this ambition, 5.1 million more teachers will be needed globally by 2030. 5.1 by 2030. Policymakers need to take action now to make sure a lack of teachers does not hold back these ambitions. 
Such numbers only count the new teaching positions needed to ensure quality education for all. In addition, countries must also replace teachers who leave the workforce because of retirement, illness, or other reasons. Why are so many teachers needed now and in the coming decades? This is a question that we've been asking ourselves at the, team, at the Global Monitoring Report team. In many countries, classrooms are already chronically overcrowded, and more teachers are needed to bring class sizes down to levels necessary to ensure that children can learn. This is very important. In Chad, for example, a primary school child will be contending for the attention of a teacher with over 60 other children in the class. This rises to over 100 children if the teacher is qualified. In addition, teacher recruitment and training just isn't keeping up with population growth. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the region facing the largest need for more teachers, for every 100 school age ch children today, there will be 143 in 2030. Neither is it keeping pace with the soaring demand for education. This huge need for teachers cannot be left unaddressed. We are hopeful that new global goals after 2015 will build momentum to put the spotlight onto a quality education for all. But ladies and gentlemen, children cannot wait two more years. The solution must start now. Our next Education for All Global Monitoring Report will explore this teacher vacuum and how it can be filled. It will present strategies for finding and supporting teachers to provide a quality education. We find that there are many interesting and innovative strategies right across the world, which demonstrate that when we put the spotlight on teachers, we can find solutions to these problems. We hope all of you here will, will support us in escalating this report's message to your policymakers. This report will be entitled, Teaching and Learning, Achieving Quality for All and will be launched on January 14, 2014. Today's slogan is a call for teachers. The truth is that every child needs a good teacher, a teacher who is trained, motivated, and keen to support those at most risk of not learning. No child deserves anything less. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kwame, and let me assure you that uh, we will um, do everything that we can uh, to ensure that that report um, is heard by those who need to hear it. We'd like to now invite um, some of our partners um, to make statements. Uh, important international organisations who are committed to education and to partnership with the world's teachers to speak about the world ahead in this Unite campaign. So if I could invite our partners to come and um, uh, sit at the table. Thank you. Uh, UNICEF, um, Global Partnership for Education, the Global Education First Initiative, and the Global Campaign for Education. I'd like to begin by inviting, um, uh, on behalf of UNICEF, Joe Bourne, Associate Director for Education of UNICEF, to address us. Thank you, Susan. Um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here to UNICEF um, in celebration of today's um, event. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to engage in this um, Education International's Unite for Education campaign, which is launched in celebration, I think, of World Teachers' Day. The overarching theme of the campaign, Unite, is particularly pertinent because we know that we will not be able to accelerate action on education unless we work together and that teachers are at the heart of whether we will succeed or not. But the challenge that we face today 
is not quite the same as the challenge we faced 15 years ago. The strategies that we've used to increase access, to recruit and train more teachers, to supply textbooks, toilets, remove fees, build classrooms, these have been successful and they remain phenomenally important. But we need to go further if we are serious about making sure that all children, regardless of where they live, who they are, have the opportunity to learn. And if we're serious about learning for all, we need to sharpen our focus on two things, equity and learning. We know a lot about children who are out of school, particularly thanks to the Global Monitoring Report. We know that economic status, location, gender, are all strong determinants of whether children will stay in school. We know that going to school at the right age and progressing through school year on year, rather than repeating, is a strong predictor of whether a child will complete a cycle of education. We know that children with disabilities, we know that girls, remain systematically excluded from education. Access to trained teachers is central to addressing equity in education. We need more teachers, as Kwame has just said, but we need them in the right places. There's evidence across a wide number of countries showing unequal distribution of teachers that places disadvantaged and marginalized children at a clear educational disadvantage. This analysis, which UNICEF is supporting as part of its contribution to the International Task Force on Teachers, suggests that this issue is widespread. The problem of unequal distribution of teachers is not limited to developing countries, but is more acute in those places where poverty, disability, gender, location are already excluding children. Teachers of marginalized children are working in under-resourced schools. They're generally younger and less experienced. They have, on average, less education and less training. Teachers of marginalized children are more likely to be male than female. These results are surprisingly consistent across countries and regions. They point to our need to sharpen our collective effort towards solutions that will reach and teach the most marginalized children through recruiting, training, and supporting the best possible people. The second area where we need to sharpen our focus is on learning. No big surprises there. We know, as Kwame has said, that there are sadly many children in school who are not learning. We know that the investments that we've collectively made into education and must continue to make at even greater levels are not routinely translating into learning outcomes. Yesterday, Tony Lake, the executive director, asked me why I use the word learning rather than quality. I thought it was quite astute of him to notice this. And I don't have a problem with the word quality. It's a very, very good word. Um, but I worry that it's become a catch-all. It's come a catch-all for the last decade or so where it's been translated into proxy indicators, all of which are important. Pupil-teacher ratios, classrooms, textbooks, toilets, they all matter. They're at the center of UNICEF's child-friendly schools approach. But they're not adequate measures of learning. And that's why UNICEF was pleased to co-chair the Learning Metrics Task Force. This was 118 countries, 1,700 uh, inputs into the consultation, several technical working groups, 30 organizations, including, of course, Education International. The recommendations were launched last week. And they call for us to work together on a dialogue that promotes access plus learning. They recommend seven domains of learning which are very broad-based, including physical, cognitive, and emotional well-being, as well as the literacy, numeracy, science, and maths types of things that you would probably expect to see there. It suggests that a small number of indicators be globally tracked. It recommends very strongly support to countries, districts, schools, and teachers to better assess learning and to critically use those assessments to inform and improve outcomes. So what will UNICEF do to take a sharper agenda forward? On equity, we will continue to work with our partner governments to develop evidence-based policies and practices that meet the education needs of the most marginalized, including interventions that will increase access to well-trained and well-supported teachers. 
We're showing, for example, through the de development of a simulation model focused on equity, that in-service teach training in Ghana is potentially more cost-effective, will get better results, will be cheaper, and have better reach a larger number of children than some of the more traditional measures. We will also continue, as a key partner with the Global Partnership for Education, to advocate for the inclusion of teachers in the policy dialogue at country level and globally. On learning, we'll be looking to strengthen effective teaching practice and the assessment of learning across our portfolio, with a view to increasingly being able to share examples of policy and practice where these are making a difference. We know, for example, that in Afghanistan we can see students learning in small groups with locally hired and trained teachers, and this is demonstrating good learning outcomes. We know, for example, in Karamoja, where I visited recently in Uganda, that a mentoring program is supporting school principals and teachers, and we are seeing more motivated teachers and better classroom practice. It's not being evaluated yet, but it shows some initial results that are promising. We will look at how we can play our part in the implementation of the Learning Metrics Task Force recommendations. And we will advocate through the post-2015 agenda for a focus on equity and on learning. So to conclude, together we can reach the most marginalised and support them to learn. We can do this by do, no, doing what we know works and also by being willing to do things differently. And teachers are at the forefront of doing things differently. They I've been a teacher. They innovate every day because of their passion to help individual child children in their classrooms learn. We know that. We need to build upon that. We need to learn from that. We need to listen to those experiences, which is why I welcome the launch of the website. And I encourage everybody here, please look past the average statistics, relentlessly seek solutions that will help the most marginalized child reach their full potential, because only when we have done that can we say that we've succeeded. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jo. Could I now invite Alice Albright, the CEO of the Global Partnership uh, for Education, to address us. Thanks, Alice. Thank you very much. Very good to be here and see many of uh, GPE's partners around the room. First, Susan, I'd like to thank you and Fred Llewellyn uh, of Education International for inviting me here to this special event on World Teacher's, Day, World Teacher's Day to celebrate the importance of quality educators around the world. I have great personal respect and admiration for the teaching profession. Uh, there are four members of my immediate family who are in the teaching profession, and my entire career was determined by one teacher in college, and I've been working in that area ever since, so it's a very personal issue for me. I also want to thank all of you at Education International for being champions for helping to ensure that we have quality education for every child. And in particular, I want to thank David Edwards, our good buddy, uh, who's been on the GPE board for many, many years. Uh, you are a thought leader and you occupy a critical seat on the GPE board, so we're very grateful and it's great to work with you. And then finally, I'd like to thank you, uh, Gordon, the Special Envoy for Education, for raising the profile of education on the political agenda, uh, certainly for the past year, but in particular for the last few weeks during the UN General Assembly. It has been an absolute pleasure to work with you and your staff. The Global Partnership for Education knows and understands full well that quality education simply cannot exist without quality educators. Children cannot learn to read or write without quality learning materials. And teachers cannot teach without a quality learning environment. Today, there are some 28.5 million teachers working in classrooms around the world, but in many countries, less than half of all teachers have the minimum training required. For example, only 36% of teachers in Honduras are trained. In, in Benin, it's only 47%, and in Senegal, it's 48%. These governments are working hard to improve these numbers, but these numbers are still not where they need to be. Picture a classroom in the Central African Republic where one teacher has 81 students in their classroom, or Rwanda where the average class size is 58 students. The good news is that many countries working with GPE have improved student-teacher ratios, including Timor-Leste, who we met with last week. 
where the average teacher-student ratio is now 31 per teacher, down from 47 last year. That is, or 47 in the past. That's actually very good progress. But despite this progress, UNESCO estimates that we still need 6.8 million teachers by 2015. And it's no wonder that a majority of this shortage is caused by either people leaving the profession or retirement, retiring. This spells out a very clear message to me. We have, to, we have work to do, and we have much more that we need to do. And this is why we are so proud to be here and to support the Unite for Education campaign. Not only do teachers have key decision-making power on the GPE board, but we've also chosen to focus on teachers as one of our core strategic objectives in our strategic plan. It is one of five key areas that we focus on consistently day in, day out in the GPE work. GPE is working to ensure that teacher policies and issues are integrated into education sector plans in the nearly 60 countries that we work in and also into our grant funding programs. We work to give teachers a voice at the country level. We are committed to ensuring further that the three pillars of the Unite for Education campaign are being implemented in GPE's nearly 60 developing country partners. First and foremost, GPE works with our partners to improve teacher effectiveness and training and recruiting and retaining teachers. Secondly, we work to ensure that teachers have adequate learning materials and that they are actually being used. Last week at the GBC breakfast, which I thought was terrific, thanks to Sarah, Sarah's good work, I was thrilled to hear that Fred Van Leeuwen had announced a new partnership between EI and Intel specifically to look at teaching and learning throughout with ICT tools. I'm very eager to learn more about this partnership and think it's something that we should look at specifically at GPE. Lastly, we are addressing the campaign's third pillar by investing in school construction, rehabilitation, and equipment to ensure that every child has a safe, child-friendly environment to learn in. But we need to do more. We need the resources to improve the effectiveness of teaching, to improve the right conditions, for holistic learning outcomes. The reality is that there is a crisis in financing for basic education. External aid to education is dropping faster than any other sector. It is down 15 percent between 2009 and 2011. And domestic resources, while they are being increased in many countries, are still far from sufficient to provide quality education. The Unite for Education campaign could not be more timely for GPE and for our entire education space. If 30 million teachers raise their voices and unite for all children in the world to receive a quality education, then governments will listen, and more importantly, governments will act. We will not unite with you to mobilize political will and resources to support teachers and support our learners. We, would not, we unite with you to make sure that when we convene the world's leaders next June in Brussels for our second replenishment conference, that they commit to helping us achieve this critical vision of a quality education for all. And above all, we unite with you to help forge and strengthen our political will so that it matches up to and serves our children's dreams. Thank you very much for including me. Thank you very much, Alice. I'd like to now invite, on behalf of the Global Education First Initiative, Rebecca Jensen. Susan Hopgood, uh, Dr. Kishore Singh, Special Rapporteur for the Right to Education, Mr. Gordon Brown, Special Envoy for Education, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow panelists and, and colleagues. Let me also join former speakers in congratulating Education International for organizing this event and for launching the new campaign, Unite for Education, Better Quality Education for a Better World. I'm very pleased to be here today uh, with you and uh, be part of supporting these major efforts. While I'm representing the Global Education First initiative, I would like to speak first on behalf of UNESCO a long-standing partner of Education International and champion of teachers worldwide. For decades, UNESCO has been collaborating closely with Education International to advocate for and defend the rights of teachers. Together with the ILO, we developed the benchmark recommendations concerning the status of teachers. 
And guided by these standards, we are working with governments across all regions, and in particular in Africa, to develop policies to enhance teacher recruitment, training, retention, status, and working conditions. We very much welcome this campaign as an opportunity to build greater support for these efforts. And to show our solidarity, UNESCO's Director General, Irina Bukova, is currently standing alongside Education International's Secretary General, Fred van Leuven, in a parallel kickoff event in Paris right now, organize, organized as part of our annual celebration of World Teachers' Day. Teachers are the most important factor for quality education, and this is why supporting their training and professional development is a top priority for UNESCO. This is also why teachers are so important to realizing the three objectives of the UN Secretary General's Global Education First Initiative, of which UNESCO is the Secretariat. We cannot put every child in school, improve the quality of learning, or foster global citizenship without more well-trained and adequately supported teachers. And we encourage all GFE partners to get behind the Unite for Education campaign as a major contribution to our efforts both to accelerate progress towards the 2015 education goals and also to position education centrally in the post-2015 development agenda. Last week in New York, UN Special Envoy uh, Mr. Gordon Brown convened in support of GFE a series of meetings aimed at overcoming obstacles to access and learning in countries most off track for achieving education for all. In all the discussions, heads of state, ministers, development partners highlighted the lack of qualified teachers as a major bottleneck that urgently needs to be addressed as a precondition for advancing the education agenda. The campaign can help mobilize the political will and financing to support these acceleration efforts. The campaign can also support Jeffy in promoting a bold vision for education post-2015. While consultation on, on goals and indicators is ongoing, there is a consensus that any new agenda must move from access to access and quality. We also know that quality education in this 21st century must foster not only fundamental cognitive skills, but also the values the attitudes and softer competences required by learners to engage and thrive as global citizenship. Today in Paris, UNESCO has organized a special discussion on the role of teachers in promoting global citizenship. And this is part of a wider discussion we are facilitating to deepen understanding of the reforms needed in pedagogy, in curricula, in the learning environment to foster global citizenship. This Unite for Education campaign speaks of education for a better world. Let us work together over the next 12 months to promote the role of teachers, not only in imparting knowledge and skills, but in inspiring, guiding, and empowering learners to become the citizens that we need and that we want. Achieving quality education for all will require more political leadership, more money, and more and better qualified teachers. Through Jeffy and the Unite for Education campaign, we will jointly advocate for this change. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Vicky. And uh, can I now invite Rashid, Rashida Chowdhury uh, to speak on behalf of the Global Campaign for Education. Susan Hopgood, His Excellency Gordon Brown, distinguished panel speakers, friends from teacher unions, members of Education International, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning to all of you. Thanks to Education International for inviting me as a GC representative to this August gathering. 
Let me, at the very outset, salute our teachers, our mentors, our friends, our guides all over the world. I'm here not only because you have invited me, but also because a teacher was there helping me, guiding me when I was young. My parents brought me to this world, helped me to grow up. But it was my teacher who showed me the way to grow up as a good citizen, to stand up against injustice and to speak out what is right. And here I am feeling privileged to speak on behalf of the Global Campaign for Education, uh, GC, a worldwide movement of civil society groups where teachers are very important stakeholders. EI was the founder member of Global Campaign for Education. As GC, we remain committed to the goal of uniting for quality education, better education for a better world. We, as GC, are also committed to the other issue, which is kind of a non-negotiable principle to us, that providing quality education to each and every citizen is a state responsibility. We don't want our governments to shift their responsibility to other actors. Other actors could be there, but this state commitment must be there. And the other point, we don't buy into that particular premise of having cheap education anywhere in the world. Quality costs money. And the state have to provide that resources. I could talk about South Asia. How much money we are spending per child per year for primary education? It's between the range of 30 to 50 US dollars. But northern countries are providing something like 3,000 US dollars <coughs> per year per child. We can't talk about quality education and quality teachers with that kind of investment. So that's where we have to put our heads together, enough resources for uniting for education, better education for a better world. All of us present here know about the teacher gap all over the world. It's becoming a major crisis. Can we afford not to wake up and unite for quality education? And the other thing, have we ever thought of the issue that only a little reduction in global military expenditure can bring in each and every child to school, can pay for each and every teacher, remuneration and professional development, and we are still hearing about quality teachers for quality education. Let's do something about it rather than just talking and having all this. That's why I really commend Education International for having this campaign to come up with a collective voice that enough has been done in terms of talking. Let's do something. Let's act together to get all the teachers, quality teachers, for their training, for their professional development. I, on behalf of GC, would like to express our solidarity to the demand for further investment in teacher training, their conditions, and professional development. At this very moment, it's 10 o'clock morning. In my country, it's 8 o'clock in the evening. There is a live talk show going on for teachers' development. And we have been working together for that. Newspaper supplements will be there, 5th of October, World Teachers' Day. Wake up calls going to our government and our political leaders. And there will be community mobilizations in 51 locations in Bangladesh with teacher unions, NGOs and other civil society groups, communities, holding hand, hands together and joining your campaign, madam. Let me end my intervention by telling you the story of a teacher in a remote rural village of Bangladesh. Three decades ago, a rural primary school, a teacher, young, youthful, joined, but discovered that almost 40% children of school going age were not enrolled. And worse still, those who got enrolled, 20% did 
dropping out before completing the primary cycle. He started going from door to door, mobilized the teachers and the communities, and you know what? Despite the resource constraint, he could mobilize local resources and pour for additional qualified teachers and their professional development. Subsequently, he became the head teacher and got numerous national awards. The nation is proud to have teachers like him all over Bangladesh, despite the resource constraint. This particular school has now become a model of collective efforts of the community pioneered by a teacher. And people from Nepal, Bhutan, and other South Asian countries coming to visit that school. How the teacher made that difference. Ladies and gentlemen, let me take this opportunity to felicitate those teachers without whose commitment and hard work we would not have been here. Let's make up, wake up, and unite for quality education. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for your patience. And let me, on behalf of everybody here, thank uh, all of you uh, for your contribution to, to our launch this morning. Your support, your ongoing support for our campaign, our collective objectives, is very important to us. Thank you very much. Colleagues, one of the single greatest contributions to the heightened awareness of education as a global priority in the last year has been the untiring efforts of Gordon Brown. As a seasoned political leader with recognised commitment to education, Gordon was the obvious choice for the UN Secretary General to appoint as his special envoy on global education. Since his appointment, Gordon has an impressive record of advocacy and skill in convening the key partners at the right moment. To EI, Gordon is a friend of educators and a defender of educators' and students' rights. He is a champion of quality education who is unafraid to confront governments that are not meeting their responsibilities. We are deep, deeply grateful for his presence today and, I'm and I am pleased to invite him to address you. Thank you, Gordon. Can I say, first of all, on behalf of the Secretary General of the United Nations, who's asked me to speak on his behalf, first of all today, that he wishes to send his personal best wishes, his congratulations on this huge new campaign that has been mounted by Education International, 30 million teachers in 170 million countries. And he wishes not only to applaud what you're doing, but to congratulate you on the timing of this new campaign, just over two years before we have to complete the Millennium Development Goals to emphasize the importance of access and quality to education is the most important thing that teachers around the world can do. And he looks forward, he has told me, to working with you in Education First to raise the banner for education and to make the world realize that unless we invest more in education and unless we are able to hire more teachers, then we will have generations of young people who are unemployed and unemployable. And it is our duty to tell the whole of the world that education must, as he has said in his campaign, come first. Now, everywhere I go in the world, when I see young girls and boys in need, I see teachers determined to help them. Whenever I see young children who are laid low by child labor and the slavery of having to work when they should be at school, I see teachers who are desperate to rescue them. Whenever I see young girls who are forced into early marriage against their will and denied the right to an education, I see teachers determined to free them and release them. And whenever I see girls discriminated against, as we knew happened with Malala in Pakistan, girls who put their lives at risk for the right to education, I see teachers determined to save them. So I want to thank Education International for its work in every country of the world in promoting not only the needs of teachers, but the right of every child to education. And your internationalism is such that you see very clearly that an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And when the strong help the weak, it makes us all stronger. 
Now, I was once a teacher myself, and I know that the profession of teaching, it stands for integrity, it stands for impartiality, objectivity, the pursuit of truth, the search for knowledge, and I found that these were all the qualities I had to leave behind when I went into politics. <laughs> and my wife, Sarah, wrote a book when she asked people all over the world who, apart from their relatives, who was the greatest influence on their lives. And almost invariably, people who spoke about what and who had influenced their lives most said it was an individual teacher. And none of us ever forget the teacher we had when we were young. And when it came to perhaps the most famous football manager in the world, Alec Ferguson, who's a friend of mine, he said that it wasn't a football star or a football manager or a football coach that was the greatest influence on making him the best manager in the world. It was a primary school teacher who had inspired him to do his best at every point. And we know that teachers unlock the potential of children who otherwise would be unfulfilled. We know that teachers can bridge the gap and help bridge the gap between what children are and what they have it in themselves to become. Some of, me, you, you, some of you may have heard of the French writer who said, you can survive for 30 days without food, and eight days without water, and three minutes without air, but you cannot survive for a second without hope, and it is teachers that give young people the hope that they can build a better future. So today, on World Teachers Day, as we are planning this campaign for the months ahead, it is important that we honor the status and the professionalism, the dedication and the commitment of millions of teachers around the world who far beyond the call of duty are helping young children in some of the most difficult and dire circumstances realize the potential. And I also want to thank teachers because in the last 30 or 40 years when other causes have been in fashion, when sometimes the needs of education have been neglected, when sometimes other issues have become far more prominent and people have thought that you could shift resources from education and it would be an easy way of making a better world. You have stood firm for the right of every child to education, but more than that, for universal, free, compulsory, quality education. And I think you are being proven right in everything that you have stood for over these years. And whether it has been fighting back after the Pakistan floods or the tsunami in Asia, or whether it was the Beslan massacre or the attempted massacre of children and teachers at these schools, you have said that in every situation, in every circumstance in which people face difficulty, we must uphold, particularly in conflict countries and in broken down regimes, the right of every ch child to continue their education despite the circumstances in which they face. But you have stood firm and two big changes have happened I believe over the last year or two, that make it imperative that we now build on the successes that you have had to fight for universal education in our generation. And the first big change is that people are coming to realize that if a nation is to be successful, any nation is to be prosperous, then it has to invest in education. Look at all the scientific, academic, professional work about why nations fail and why nations succeed. And they write about culture and the difference between some nations failing and succeeding are the institutions and the quality of them. And they write about whether you've got resources or not, what your geographical position is, the location in relation to the rest of the trade in the world. But increasing, increasingly, the academic science is coming to understand the truth that you've always understood, that no nation will succeed in the modern world unless it invests in education. And no nation will move from a low income or a middle-income country to being a high-income country unless it invests in quality education. And I do believe, and I do believe that the significance of your technology initiative with companies and with governments, where you are saying that you do not see technology as a threat to the future of education, but a means by which you can improve education, the teacher being the sage on the stage perhaps, but the guide by your side, and technology empowering young people through tuition as well as through technology to make the best of their potential. And it is one way by creating an online global education platform that you now support 
that the work of teachers can be enhanced and your professionalism extended so that we can get to every child so that even in the most remote area, the poorest country, the least promising circumstances in the world, the poorest pupil may have access to the best library materials in any continent, in any part of the world. So I applaud your commitment that to build a successful economy of the future in each and every individual country, you will not only mobilize the case for investment in education, but put technology at the service of teachers, not replacing teachers, but technology used by teachers to give people a better education. But you know the second big change over the last year, and I think you all know it, from what you've seen in the newspapers and on television, and we must build on this, is that young boys and girls themselves are standing up for their right to quality education. And they're not prepared to accept second best. They want quality education in the arguments they put. And I believe that Malala Yousafzai, that young girl who sacrificed her life, uh, who risked her life and was prepared to sacrifice her life fighting for education, she has done more to speak up for the rights of girls to education in a few short months than millions of men have done in centuries when they should have been campaigning for the rights of girls to education. And what I see, what I see around the world is what I would call a civil rights struggle. Girls particularly no longer prepared to accept that they should be passive and acquiescent and allow other people to determine their future free of education. Girls fighting back, as in Bangladesh, with child marriage-free zones against being forced into child marriage. The Global March for Labour in India and elsewhere, releasing young children from bondage and slavery and forced work. And all these campaigns are showing that a civil rights struggle is on in our generation to establish for the first time that every single girl and every single boy has the right to education. And it is something upon which I believe we must now build. And so what should we now do? Faced with the reality that no country can succeed without investing in education, and faced with this new demand from young people themselves that their needs for quality education have got to be taken seriously, I believe we've got to recognize that in these next two years, we have a unique opportunity, if we work together, to make a huge difference. Yes, it is true that aid is being cut at the moment, and we've got to fight that. And yes, is it true that no country that I know of will have its leaders make education the priority unless we force them to do so. But yes, it is possible if we form a constructive partnership with all those people who've got an interest in securing education for every child and quality education at that, then we can make an enormous difference over the next few years. And that is why in the last year I have tried to look at each country that is failing to meet the universal target look at them one by one, get the leaders of these countries round the table. But what I would like you to do is before we have the next meetings with these leaders, we step up the domestic pressure on them in all of these countries to take the needs of education as a priority seriously. And we need to mobilize business. We need to mobilize faith groups. We need to mobilize young people. We need to mobilize the teachers' organizations that you represent yourself. We need to mobilize the whole of civil society and if we can create a mood for change in these countries, then I believe that despite what has been happening in the decisions about resources, we can force these countries into realizing what we know already, that education is not only the way to unlock individual opportunity, it is not only the only way we can break the cycle of poverty, but it is also the way that individual nations who are poor can become prosperous and eliminate the poverty of their citizens in the future. Now we are tested in almost every part of the world because of either prejudice against girls' education, child labor, child trafficking, child marriage, these obstacles preventing teach uh, people going to school, but also because of the absence of teachers. And we heard these uh, startling figures, and I pay tribute to the work that is done by UNESCO, Irina Bukova, and uh, Pauline Rose at UNESCO in showing us that we are 1.6 million short of the teachers we need even to get to the Millennium Development Goal of Universal Primary Education in 2015, and millions more short of the numbers we need, the five million we need to get universal secondary education underway by 2030. But I believe if we can bring people together, we can put that case for additional resources and find that we have contributors to that. New donors, 
countries spending more themselves, a reallocation of resources from the things that you've been talking about today that are wasteful expenditure to good expenditure, and it is public pressure led by you and others that will make the difference. And we fight in every area. And today we think of 400,000 child refugees from Syria who are now in Lebanon, a million child refugees from the Syrian conflict who are now deprived of food, shelter, health care, and also education. And we've got to start establishing the principle that even in the most broken down area of the world, just as the Red Cross established a right to health, we have got to establish that there is also a right to education. And we can start immediately because there is a plan, and Joe Bourne, who is here of UNICEF, has been involved in the last few days in drawing this up, to provide in Lebanon 400,000 places over a period of time for the number of refugees in that country. The child refugees have been excluded from, Le uh, from Syria but have no hope of education unless we do something about it. And by using the existing schools on a double shift system, we could start almost immediately, if we have the international finance to do so, to get these children to school, to give them the chance of an education, to stop them being a wasted generation, to stop them being deprived of their own childhood and to stop them being deprived of hope. And I tell you, this is a testing time because it is the worst humanitarian crisis of this century and yet we have an opportunity to do something about it immediately to help children not only have food and shelter but to have education. And I want us in these next few weeks to establish the right that every child, irrespective of borders, irrespective of boundaries between countries, has wherever they are the right to education in this world. Now, what are we fighting for in the end? It is not simply about the provision of education. It is about the equality of opportunity that every child should have. There is a story that some of you may have heard that in the 1980s, Ronald Reagan was asked by the Prime Minister of Sweden, Olaf Palme, who was the champion of international development, particularly for children, if he would meet him at the White House to hear what he had to say. And Ronald Reagan agreed to the meeting, and then the day that the meeting happened, he turned to his advisors and said, isn't this man from Sweden, isn't he a communist? And his advisors said, no, Mr. President, he's an anti-communist. And Ronald Reagan said, I don't care what kind of communist he is. <laughs> and Ronald Reagan said to Olaf Palme, do you want to abolish the rich? And he said, no, I want to abolish the poor. I want every single child in the world to have the chance to realize the potential to the full. And that surely is what this campaign about quality education is all about. Every single child in every part of the world should have by right the chance to realize the potential to the full. You know, in ancient Rome, when they used to have speeches given from rostrums like this, Cicero was the most famous orator of the day. And it used to be said of him that when he made a speech, people used to turn to each other after he sat down and they said to each other, great speech. But in ancient Greece, Demosthenes was also an orator. And when he spoke and sat down, people didn't turn to each other and say, great speech. They turned to each other and said, let's march. So let's march for quality education. And thank you very much, Gordon. Yes, that is what we will do, March for Quality Education. Um, we're now going to shift gears a little bit here um, and have some discussion about quality education and the issues surrounding it in a practical way. The discussion will be led by Mr Ron Thorpe, who is the President and CEO of the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. The National Board is one of the leading voices in the US advocating for policies that advance student learning and professionalise uh, teaching. I'd like to invite Ron and the panel to all come to the stage. Thank you.
Colleagues, good morning. With that rousing speech by Gordon Brown, I'm tempted to begin, O tempora, O mores, <laughs> but I realize that is Cicero and not Demosthenes, and we're about to march instead of uh, worrying about the great speech. On the panel here in New York, we have education leaders from Japan, Canada, New Zealand, Uganda, the US, and the Caribbean. And at this exact moment in Paris at UNESCO, we have other colleagues from Africa, uh, Europe, Asia, and Latin America. This is happening with colleagues on every continent, but from these two continents, we gather together to celebrate and launch this important initiative led by Education International as we all unite for quality education on the occasion of this year's World Teachers Day. We're so pleased that UN uh, Special Envoy Gordon Brown was with us and, and our friend Susan Hopgood for EI. The meeting in UNESCO right now is being convened by EI's General Secretary Fred Van Leeuwen and UNESCO's Director General Irina Bakova. I think it's important that we realize that this isn't just here and now. This is a global issue, and if you can somehow imagine that great room in UNESCO, which are you, most of you have seen either live or on television, these same talks, these same sentiments are being explored and committed to. Colleagues, you have very busy schedules, and you've given your time to come today, and we are so grateful for your presence as we work to make quality education the key to a better world. I'd like to take advantage of my position as moderator, however, to say something about the National Board and our special commitment to action to this campaign and to the Clinton Global Initiative, where we are also working. This commitment starts with the belief that as teachers, we will do a better job preparing our children to be global citizens if we ourselves are part of a global profession. Indeed, it was just a year ago today when David Edwards and I were at UNESCO in Paris and we asked teachers to put a stake in the ground. We asked them to commit to making teaching a global profession, perhaps the first true global profession. That commitment has now been accepted by the Clinton Global Initiative and working with our partners, EI, National Geographic, Special Olympics, and the US-based teaching channel, we are about to engage in a very exciting uh, enterprise. We will start with 10,000 US-based National Board certified teachers. They will sit at the center or be the organizing force of small professional learning communities with nine other colleagues from other countries. And they will join in those communities virtually via the internet, discussing issues important to this campaign and other issues uh, important to our, our partners. So with National Geographic, for example, and uh, my colleague Danny Edelson, the president of the National Geographic Foundation, is here today. With them, some teachers will be working on what does it mean to be globally um, competent, across disciplines. This isn't about teaching geography. It's about understanding the global dynamics in our other subject areas. We will work with our colleagues at Special Olympics. For those teachers who are deeply concerned about children with mental and physical disabilities and what is not happening for them in many countries around the world. And they will talk about many different issues, especially those being highlighted in this important campaign. Altogether, if you've already done the math, we hope to mobilize 100,000 teachers worldwide in this effort. And the National Board will endeavor to network those networks through our partners at the US-based teaching channel to share those stories broadly. We are excited about this, and when I think about Dr. Singh's words about the need to make teaching, give teaching the stature it needs, 
I believe efforts like this help. Because as we all know, no one ever gives you respect because you ask for it. You earn respect, always. And when teachers unite this way, that will be the result of their union. We have some wonderful panelists today, and some of them have prepared remarks. And I'm going to and ask some others uh, more impromptu questions. I'll try not to surprise them too badly. And we will try hard to keep this on our schedule. So I want to start with Sandra, because uh, she is from New Zealand. And New Zealand is the host of the next International Summit on the Teaching Profession at the end of next March. So Susan, may we start with you? Sandra, sorry. Kia ora koutou. Ngā mihi nui ki a koutou i tēnei ata. Greetings everyone from New Zealand, first place to see the sun. I am representing NZDI, New Zealand Educational Institute, which has over 50,000 members from our early childhood, starting from our, our wee children right through to our 12 and 13 year olds and our support staff, teacher aides, who work in, alongside in our secondary schools as well. So it's quite a big, diverse base. I am a classroom teacher on a day-to-day basis, so I'm bringing you, as well as our NZDI perspective, a classroom teacher base, who when I go home from this fantastic city of New York, will be back into a classroom watching children run in the gate at 8.30 every morning with the joy and passion and excitement of being with their friends, being with their teachers who they have fantastic relationships with, and starting and continuing the education journey every day, which is a real privilege to have every day. For the past five years, NZDI has been fighting a campaign against what we call the GERM, the Global Education Reform Movement. It's been a hard-fought campaign. It's been with a large focus on organising and motivating our members who at times feel isolated and stuck in a school where we are having decisions handed down to us by governments on a continual basis. We have lost the voice of our profession, by the profession, for the profession, those of us who are at the chalk face every day who know what the needs of our students are, to a legislative body who determines what our education future should look like. Unfortunately, we also seem to be at the tail end of other reforms throughout the world, failed reforms, that we see, still seem a need to try out. In a few hours, in the city of Gisborne, which is the first in New Zealand to see the sun, we are launching EI's Unite for Education on the beach. And it's a really exciting opportunity for us there. And then right through our country, there will be further launches. You will get to see our photos on the website, which is a really great way to start telling the stories around the world. We have a whole exciting year planned of action, because I think that's what we need. We need action. We need members standing together and realising it's not just their colleagues at their school or centre, but it's their colleagues from throughout our country. It's the colleagues from throughout the world who will stand together and give them that support, give them that encouragement to speak for our students beyond our class that we have in front of us. If we want change to happen, it's really important that it happens from our teachers, from our schools, from our centres across the world. Time and time again, we hear rhetoric from our governments that education is important, that it's a key focus. But we're not seeing that change. We're not seeing anything other than an economic-driven model. Right now, we know that our world is facing huge challenges and huge changes. And if we want to move forward from here, we need our children coming through to be adaptive, to be collaborative, to be creative and innovative, to think outside the square, to come up with solutions for our poverty, for our future. We need to ensure that our children receive that free quality education regardless of their age, their race, their gender, where they happen to live, it should be for all. I time and time again have the chance to read the wise words of Sir Ken Robinson, 
who talks a lot about creativity and innovation for our students, and that's what we do as teachers every day. And he himself, if you'll indulge me, referred to a W.B. Yeats poem, who in his poem said, Had I the heavens embroidered cloths, and wrought with gold and silver light, the blue and the dim and the dark, cloths of night and light, and the half light, excuse me, I would spread the cloths under your feet. But I, being poor, have only my dreams. I spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly, because you tread on my dreams. And as Ken points out, every day, everywhere throughout our world, our children spread their dreams beneath our feet. And we should tread softly. Thank you. Sandra, thank you for the light and the half light. Let's go to uh, Japan, where the sun also rises pretty early on our world. And uh, we'll turn to our colleague, Yasunaga Akamata. Good morning, everybody. I am Okamoto from Japan Teachers Union. I was elected chairperson at the seventh year AP conference in KL last month. My first job as EAP chair is this launch of MQE. I am excited and feel a great sense of responsibility. I hope to channel all my energy for the success of this campaign for the children of Japan, Asia Pacific, and the world. Allow me to <coughs> outline some issues in Japan in realizing a high quality public education. Unfortunately, there are growing political forces in Japan that try to promote neoliberal thinking or nationalistic policies. This is also being pushed onto education. One of the ATU's initiative is a smaller class size the DPZ government's committed to Children First was established in 2009. A decision was made to gradually decrease class size from 40 to 35. For the first time in 30 years, it began in grade one and reached grade two, but the new liberal democratic government has stopped this program. Increase in education expenses is also a major issue. The previous government introduced free senior high school education. It also withdrew the hold there was on the gradual introduction of free education in relation to the ratification of UN social rights. The new government policies attempt to negate this and discussion to place means testing of parents for the to issue. There have been no discussion regarding free higher uh, education and with strong pushed by business. The government is attempting to promote a reform that prior, uh, prioritize the strengthening of international competitiveness. It was reported at the EIP regional conference 
the neoliberal policies in education is a serious issue in South Korea. Also in the region, there are children in complex areas trying to escape, or children having to work even though they would like to go to school. Many countries will be unable to reach the MDG goal of achieving universal primary education by 2015. Our mission in the 21st century is to create a society where peace human rights, environment, coexistence, and democracy are liberal uh, respected. Education above all else is uh, necessary in achieving this. And schools are the symbol of education. Direct advocacy to government and Politicians and of course important, and we will persevere in this. However, that alone is not sufficient. The ZTU considers social dialogue with students, guardians, and citizens to be the core of our work, and we are holding gathering and Symposium together with teacher and staff organizations in each prefecture, pre, in a prefecture. We will also conduct a national education campaign using mass media in November. This concludes my reports. Let us join into work together. Thank you. So much. We might as well uh, continue with uh, Sandra's theme, and we'll follow the sun to Uganda. Uh, James Twaheo, would you like to speak to this audience? Thank you. I come from a country in Africa with a population of 35 million people, 78 percent of who are the youth between zero of age and uh, 30 with 159,000 teachers in public schools and 105,000 of them in the teachers' union. I come from a country where 8.6 million children are in primary schools, where about 2.7 and secondary, and some few, about 40,000 in tertiary and 63,000 in the universities. I come from the country where the teacher pupil ratio is on average 1 to 55 teachers, but can stretch to 120, 120 children per teacher in a class. And where the textbook pupil ratio is 1 to 10 at primary and 1 to 15 at secondary. And where computer literacy for both children and teachers is very low. I come from a country where the teacher's primary teacher's salary is $110 per month, and where that $110 is regular, where a primary school teacher can work for 30 years to get an equivalent salary of a chief executive office in the same country. And therefore, there is a problem there of quality, and of course, not only for the children, but also partly for the teachers. Irregardless of these problems, we are determined as teachers to get the situation better. Suddenly, our completion ratio is the lowest in East Africa, with only 32 children or out of every 100 who start the cycle finishing. In Rwanda, it is 74 who finish. 
out of 100. In Burundi, it is 83. We finish out of 100. In Tanzania, it is 84. And in Kenya, it is 86. Meaning that out of every 100 children who start the primary cycle, about 68 children drop out. Of course, by the time I came, the ministry had conducted research and about 68% of the teachers in the country would say, given the opportunity, they would leave the teaching in the next one year. That is how threatened our quality is, and that is the situation. Government has failed to motivate the teacher. Even in the last two years when they made a promise and signed an agreement, they have backtracked on it, resulting into a nationwide strike that lasted 10 days until government accepted to go back to the table and negotiate with the teachers. We are determined to move on, and we have launched a campaign as a matter of urgency to improve the quality of education. And on the World Teachers Day tomorrow on the 5th, every teacher in the country is planting a tree in memory and to warm up to this campaign. We have reached out and coordinated our campaign, the Quality Public Education, and we have enrolled 163 members of parliament in our team, and they have also formed a team in the parliament to influence policy. We have started awareness meetings with the parents and the religious leaders, and effective November, we shall go to every district in the country, 129 districts in the country, meeting parents, religious leaders, to generate momentum for this quality education campaign. We have started media programs, and I'm glad to mention that the public media in the country is extremely supportive. We have started our campaign with a slogan to everybody else in the country, stop pretending. Because much as we have, yes, much as we have 8 million children in school, these children are not learning. It is not possible for a teacher to teach 120 children in a, a primary one class where a lesson is 30 minutes and each child needs individual attention. It is not possible. It is total pretense. And we must stop pretending our children will have no future if we choose to do nothing at the moment. We have gone ahead to equip our teachers with the support of the Canadian Teachers Federation. We have gone ahead to support our teachers with skills of ability to handle big classes. And every single year, including last year and this year, we have trained 80 teachers out of the so many in helping in management of big classes. Much as we're moving forward, our quality is still low, and we must get things done. My call to everybody, including those in this particular room, is let us generate momentum and make it risky for the people in governance to ignore this campaign. I thank you. James, uh, I thank you for reminding us of the fragility of this safety net, the one safety net that Uganda has, the one safety net that all of our countries have, and that is uh, our teaching workforce. Even in the United States today, the research shows that the modal number of years a teacher is in the classroom is one. There are more first-year teachers in the United States than any other kind of teacher. What is the long-term impact of that? And we're feeling it across the globe. Let's go on to Grenada and Marvin Andal, who not only represents Grenada, but all of the Caribbean teachers. Marvin. Thank you very much. And good morning, colleagues. <clears throat> I hope that you'll all do better in understanding my Caribbean accent than my taxi driver yesterday. Because <laughs> I told him to take me 
on Broadway, <laughs> 52nd on, broad, on Broadway, and he took me to a place, 52nd and Broadway. <laughs> we are here to, be, to unite for quality education. And in the Caribbean, we see quality education as a process that unleashes the potential in our learners to achieve greatness. And in the Caribbean, despite our diminutive size geographically, we know what greatness is. We have produced the fastest men and women in the world. We have given the world some of the greatest cricketers. We have given the world reggae music, calypso, and steel band. And even a small island like St. Lucia has produced two Nobel Prize winners, one for economics and another for literature. That could not have been achieved without quality teachers and quality education. However, in the Caribbean, as far as education is concerned, there is great disparity from island to island. For example, if we compare Barbados and Haiti, for instance, in terms of education, they are worlds apart. It's black, white, in terms of the spectrum, and many shades of gray in between. That's how I choose to describe the education system across the island. Even within countries, there's great disparity in one part, for example, the urban and rural communities in terms of quality education. So a child in Judge Tongue may stand a better chance of receiving a better quality education than one in a rural community in Guyana, in the hinterland. The teachers unions and teachers have done tremendous work over the years to improve the quality of education. A lot of the success has come through the collective bargaining process. We have seen unions negotiate and have reduction in class size, improvement in the physical conditions, some improvement in teacher's salary, which has reduced the attrition rate and which has reduced, in some instance, the need for teachers to take a second job. Because that in itself poses a threat to quality. When teachers have their mind while in the classroom on another job and compete with the children when the bell goes to get to the other job, it affects the quality of education. And they have to do that in order to sustain themselves and their families. I think we have made some steps to ensure that Teacher, that students are taught by happier teachers. But we recognize that the, the glass is half full. It means that the glass is also half empty. We have seen unions being able to do some advocacy work at the national level to have some influence on the overall national goals and plans for education. We have seen the unions working to have professional advancements of teachers. And in many instances, in a number of the islands, the Canadian Teachers Federation, through its project overseas, has worked with countries like Guyana in the past, St. Vincent, Grenada, Dominica. And in recent years, we have seen Trinidad, Jamaica, and Barbados, St. Lucia, getting assistance through the CTF to do a two-week training program in the summer to give the teachers the cutting edge in regards to modern techniques and strategies for dealing with the learners that we had. So we are very thankful to the CTF in that regard. We understand that with the change in the political climate, the support that used to be had from government to CEDA for that project overseas is not as it used to be, and we lament that. We see the unions and teachers advocating to have better learners come to the school. The thing with education is that when we're in school and we get students who have certain issues or difficulties, we cannot return them. In the corporate world, when a company receives goods that are defective, they return them back to the supplier. We cannot return the students to the suppliers. Therefore, we have to ensure <coughs> as a society that we take due care such that the chances of them coming to school broken are greatly reduced. I think 
in this campaign, we should advocate to ensure that better learners come to school. We should address the issue of well-nourished children who are healthy, both physically and mentally, and who have the support of their families and their communities come to school. We have to influence the content that is delivered in terms of the curriculum. Not only the numeracy and literacy, but all the skills that will enable students or children to be better citizens and to be able to live in peace and harmony. I will be brutally honest and say that we have to improve the learning environment in the school. And in doing so, there are some teacher practices, I cannot speak for other regions, but I can speak for the Caribbean, that <coughs> threatens the safety of students in school. For instance, the use of corporal punishment. It is being reduced, but I think we, it should, more should be done so that learners could feel safe at school and the incidence of uh, physical abuse from teachers greatly reduced. I think in a campaign for quality education, this must be addressed. We cannot be asking, only asking governments to do, to improve the conditions, but there are things that we, uh, we do ourselves that, and I'm speaking in the Caribbean context, um, interfere with the quality of education in terms of the safety of the school environment. Of course, we have to continue to have improvement in the teachers' working conditions such that all our students could be taught by happier, well-motivated, and well-compensated teachers. We should aim also to have quality outcomes where we must have intentions and great expectations for all our learners and that we should all expect them to know more, to do more, have better attitude and expect and have greater expectations for themselves and the society. May we unite for quality education. I thank you. Marvin, thank you. And please be assured that everyone in this room has had trouble with New York City taxi drivers, <laughs> no matter what our accent is. Our neighbors to the north in Canada, and we're represented here today by Diane Wallacechuk, and we're pleased to have you, so this is your chance. Thank you, good morning everyone. It's a pleasure to be here on behalf of the Canadian Teachers Federation and our 17 member organizations representing about 200,000 teachers across our country. I'm very pleased to be here to participate in the launch of this initiative by EI, which we believe to be a timely and a very key initiative. We welcome the opportunity to be able to help to construct a vibrant, positive narrative from the world over about teaching and learning and about the right of every child to a free, accessible, quality, publicly funded education, an education that addresses the whole child with rich learning environments that allow these children to develop their skills and abilities through engaging curricula and uh, just a very stimulating learning environment with qualified teachers working with them. The word unite in the, the title to me is a particularly compelling word that we unite as teachers to raise our voices. The voice of teachers has been, uh, there have been many attempts to suppress that voice in uh, the last number of years. I think we're all familiar with the message about that kind of reductionist thinking about less money for education, narrow the curricula, let's, you know, very narrow accountability kinds of measures focused on standardized tests. Standardized testing will probably tell you something about what children don't know, but it won't allow them to show you what they do know. And what we're trying to do and what I see in this initiative that's so important is to take that narrow, narrow focus and push it out again. Let's have, let's talk about, let's, let's talk about the dream and the, the promise of every single child in this world having access to quality, public 
publicly funded education and that as a basic human right, that that understanding could come to be the narrative rather than this negative kind of a uh, story that we've been hearing so much. And I'd like to talk about the role of teacher organizations in that because we've also experienced that narrow thinking in terms of some of the attacks that have been made against teachers and our organizations that somehow we're only interested in uh, you know, keeping our jobs and that sort of thing. There's plenty of research that talks about how teachers become teachers because we want to make a difference in the world, and that's been alluded to this morning already. We want to uh, make a difference in our communities, work with children, work with their families, and help to create a strong democratic society. That's really what we're after. We're agents of change in our own country. So in a sense, I guess it's not surprising if there are those who don't want to see those changes there that what we're trying to do should come under attack. But our role is such a transformative, a socially transformative role, and that's why the vocation of a teacher is such an incredibly important one. I really appreciate the logo that goes with this campaign because of course as a teacher that's exactly what you see when you walk into your classroom every morning. You see all these faces and you see all these pairs of eyes looking at you. There's uh, brown eyes, blue eyes, black eyes, green eyes, there's happy eyes, energetic little eyes who just can't wait to get started. Um, you also see some mischievous eyes, sometimes some sad and lonely eyes, sometimes some angry, defeated eyes. And as a teacher, we look at all of these eyes, we look back at them with our eyes, smiling eyes that say, welcome. So glad you're here today. What can we learn together today? So we need to work together, and we need to focus on the children. I know that that's something that in Canada we've been working very hard uh, to achieve, in particularly with groups of students where we feel there is work that needs to be done. Um, our uh, theme for our annual general meeting last July was Teachers as Defenders of Democracy. And uh, we in are happy that we'll be hosting an EI meeting in March, uh, and again, um, the EI World Congress, which is coming up in 2015. I'd also like to mention that we have a partnership with the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, which is just being built and will be opening in 2014 in Winnipeg. Maybe all of you know where Winnipeg is. You might want to come <laughs> and visit. But our annual general meeting is going to be in Winnipeg next July, and our theme is um, social justice, the heart and soul of public education. And that is our job as teacher organizations, to work for justice, to see to it that every child has the right to a quality education. So let's be very determined and strong about that. Thank you. Diane, if I were chairing this meeting formally, I would say, the eyes have it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do a little pivot on my friend David Sherman because I can do that with him. Uh, we heard from Dennis Van Roekel earlier today about the, the commitment that the NEA is making, and I know the AFT joins in that same commitment to this, this campaign. But I wonder if it's time now to hear about two things that one of our teacher unions in the United States is doing two things that they are doing that are having a remarkable impact on the profession. David, I wonder if you could talk specifically about Share My Lesson, but also about the work you're doing in McDowell County. Thank you. Uh, sure. Um, good morning. It's still morning, I see. Um, uh, I will do that, Ron. Um, and you know, I had all of these or remarks anything else you talking want, about the global issues, but I'm not going to go through them because it's all been said. 
Uh, my good friend Dennis Van Rokel said them earlier, Susan Hopgood said them, previous panelists, the pa people on this panel, the wonderful teachers and leaders have said it. So it's not that I don't care about them, but I, ha I had a specific request, so I'm gonna go right into that, if I may. Um, last summer, the American Federation of Teachers, or the AFT as we call it, um, introduced a campaign which we are now um, deep into called Reclaiming the Promise. Reclaiming the promise of public education. Not what it was, not what it is, but what it should be. And we, we started that last, Ju last July. And that is now the overarching theme of the work that we're doing. And it fits in perfectly with Unite for Quality um, Education that EI is promoting. And I know the NEA is doing it as well and many places around the country. So I think the timing is right for us all to band together. Um, and our method for um, reclaiming the promise is very down to earth. It's very, we, we are doers. We believe in doing things. We believe in providing services for our members, for our children, for our communities, for our parents. So the two things that uh, Ron asked me to speak about uh, two things that I've been very personally involved in, and they are examples of how we unite for quality education, how we reclaim the promise of public education. The first one uh, that uh, <coughs> I was asked to speak on is called Share My Lesson. This is a, um, a digital online resource bank of lesson plans, teacher resources, um, uh, worksheets, authentic resources, um, assessment tools, professional development. It is free. It is available for everyone who works with children, from teachers to parents to principals to anybody. Uh, the website is www.sharemylesson.com. You can join as soon as this meeting's over. <laughs> um, it's free and it's a resource. The resources are by teachers for teachers. As of yesterday, as a matter of fact, um, we only launched it a year ago, just over a year ago, and as of yesterday, we surpassed 350,000 members, which in one year was, I think is pretty good. Um, we have about 268,000 teaching and learning resources on the site. Um, but to me, the most interesting thing about it is it tells you how hungry teachers are for quality resources, which is part of the Unite for Quality Education campaign. And the number that tells me how hungry teachers are is as of yesterday, we had just over 3.7 million resources downloaded from the site in just over a year. 3.7. Yesterday alone, 17,000 resources were downloaded. So forget all the other things. The fact is that there is a need for quality resources out there, not only here in the United States, but all over the world. And that's why I'm so glad that one of the three pillars of EI's campaign is for quality resources. Um, <clears throat> I'm not gonna go on and on. If you go on the site, there are videos, they'll tell you all about it. So you can do that for yourselves and share it with other people. Going from a teacher and professional um, perspective to one that has more to do with, with children, parents, communities, and uh, the people who we serve, okay? Um, a year and a half ago, the governor of a state in the United States, West Virginia, uh, the governor of West Virginia at that time, Joe Manchin, who is now in the United States Senate, um, asked the American Federation of Teachers to partner with him to work in a school district in the southernmost part of the state of West Virginia called McDowell County. This is a school district that is the fourth poorest community in the United States of America. I taught in New York City. I have been in public schools all over the United States. I've been in schools in Japan, in all over, in, uh, not all over, but in a lot of places in the world. I have never seen poverty like I experienced in McDowell County, West Virginia, never. Um, the, it is a, um, it's rural, it's country, it is um, a place that was the heart of the coal mining um, boom of the 50s and 60s, and when it was a boom town, they had 150,000 people living there. There are now 22,000 people 
Why? Because the coal mining companies took all the coal and they left, and with them left the jobs. So they have been trying in West Virginia for 10 years to do something through the schools, um, and they were unsuccessful. The state of West Virginia took over the schools in McDowell County, and in 10 years they admitted that they couldn't, couldn't get anything done. So we joined with them, and we started an initiative called Reconnecting McDowell. Reconnecting McDowell, connecting it to the rest of the state, connecting it to the rest of the country, connecting it to the rest of the world. This was such a difficult location to work in, you couldn't even turn on a cell phone or um, you know, any device because there was no connectivity. Okay? There was, the schools did not have um, equipment that worked because they didn't have broadband capacity. The drug problem there um, is unbelievable. 50 over 50% unemployment rate. The children, 70% of the children do not live with a biological parent. So anyhow, we joined up with the governor and we then invited in many other organizations, business, community groups, medical, colleges, and whatnot, and we formed Reconnecting McDowell, we which is now a group of 140 organizations that have volunteered to work to help McDowell County. Um, I tell you this, and it, it breaks my heart every time I'm there, although I now I feel so much better, because in just over a year, working with everybody, and I mean everybody, um, every school and every home in McDowell County is now hooked up to the internet. Um, we now have the first after school and summer programs and camp programs that we've ever had there, and on and on and on and on, okay? Again, I'm not gonna take up the rest of the day, but if you wanna see this online, there's a website called reconnectingmcdowell.org, www.reconnectingmcdowell.org. But what this really says is that the promise can be accomplished. As bad as things may be, as much you know, as we are under attack, there are solutions that we can all come together and do. And I just wanna end by saying a few things, um, some of which has been said, but some of which from my own experience I think it's important. What we need, particularly for teachers, is we need respect. We need not to be bashed, not to be denigrated, we need to be respected. Teachers need their rights supported. Um, their rights for voice, as my colleague from New Zealand said, their rights for collective bargaining, and I have to say I was shocked to hear that even at the UN they're turning their back on collective bargaining. I couldn't believe that. That's a personal comment. Um, uh, but teachers need their rights supported. Um, we need to provide the uh, supports and resources at the highest levels, not only bountiful, but of quality. And we need to reclaim the promise of public education for everyone, from the Americas to uh, uh, Australia to Argentina and everyone else all over the world. Um, and we need to do it for every single child. We need to raise our hands, Dennis. We need to raise our hands with Dennis and the uh, NEA for all students in all countries, students who are disabled, students who may not be native language speakers, and here in the case of America, uh, English, uh, for, um, for uh, GLBT students who are so often the victims of harassment, um, and bullying, for poor students, for students of diverse backgrounds, whatever their unique needs are, we need to raise, uh, raise our hands for students uh, all around the world. So I say let's unite for quality, for public education, because without it we will never have a better world. David, thank you. Those are two wonderful other examples, and there are many, many out there of how we are already uniting for quality education, and it's, it's very encouraging to hear those stories. Sandra started us out with uh, William but Butler Yeats, and I'm going to end with uh, a great American poet, Robert Frost, and some of his lines, where he said, only when love and need are one, and the work is play for mortal stakes. Is the deed ever really done for heaven and the future's sake? Teachers know about love and need. They know it more than anyone. And these are mortal stakes. 
We are so proud to join with EI and educators across the globe to make this happen. Please join me in welcoming and thanking our <laughs> panelists. Well, thank you very much, um, Ron, and for uh, all of the panellists uh, for, for the discussion. Um, I think it's the beginning of a discussion, really, and um, we're hoping that this is a discussion that we can continue um, online uh, um, because we do need to keep talking about these issues, talk about what we see as quality education and put our ideas forward. Um, colleagues, we... We are ending, we end where we begin, by announcing the launch of the global campaign, Unite for Quality Education. We use the word quality very deliberately because we believe that every student deserves quality teaching and quality tools and environments for teaching and learning. It is vital for every student, not just the privileged, to be provided the tools and skills for the 21st century job market. And we must focus on the power of education to foster citizenship, helping people and nations to, as the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said, forge more just, peaceful and tolerant societies. Rashida's story about the young primary teacher who went outside the classroom to take action on behalf of children unenrolled and dropping out is the kind of story that we will be spreading around the world. The dedication to improving the quality of education and opportunities for young people is the work of teachers. Our responsibility, our responsibility in international organisations is to help provide them the training, tools and environments to succeed. The challenges are great. Alice told us of the declining financial support for education even as she embraced the partnership with the UNITE campaign and others to advocate for the change we need. James noted the average teacher-pupil ratio in Uganda is 55 to 1 in the primary grades, and the textbook ratio is one book for every, primary for every 10 primary students. And Gordon Brown echoed the concerns of financing and challenged us, nation by nation, to pressure governments to move on this crisis, to establish and maintain public financing of education as a priority. What we have heard today is that teachers, teacher organisations and our organisational partners are indeed united in pursuit of better quality education for a better world. Kwame reminded us of the continuing wealth of information from the Global Monitoring Report showing that the trained teacher gap is severe and growing. We heard from UNICEF about the important results from in-service teacher training in Africa and the importance of including teachers in setting policies and establishing priorities. Amidst all of the discussion of education policy and the work of organisations, we also heard an essential truth. Education is a human right. But more than that, when we educate children, we build better, freer and more democratic societies and equip students not only with skills for work, but with aptitude for life. I said before that no organisations have fought as hard as those representing educators for the resources and tools and proper environments for teaching and learning and to professionalise the teaching core. Today, that commitment is strengthened. The special challenge that we are taking on through the UNITE campaign is to raise the voices and experiences of educators around the world, to bring their success, their hopes and their challenges to a global audience. 
as Gordon Brown said, teachers unlock potential. They close the gap between what they are and what they can become. This is a tremendous responsibility. The 30 million educators of Education International have taken on that responsibility in their classrooms and in their workplaces. And today, through the Unite campaign, these educators will be heard and seen by a global audience. And we are very excited to learn from and work with our partners who share the belief emanating from those classrooms, those communities and nations that the key to a better world is a better education. And let me finish by thanking all of those people who have been responsible and involved for making this such a success. Thanks to UNICEF and to the staff for their organisation, for their obviously for hosting uh, here and also for their organisational assistance. Thanks to our um, member organisations here in the United States, the NEA and the AFT, for all of their support and assistance. And to Jackie um, and all the staff of Widmire, um, we appreciate your assistance. And of course, to the EI staff, this event would not have happened without all of the work that has been done. Not only here, of course, and in Paris, but also connecting, uh, connecting us to the world through the webcast. So to Undra and, and all of the other colleagues, to Steve, um, of course, to Charlie and to David, to Timo um, and uh, Antonia. Thank you very, very much for all of your work. And thank you, lastly, of course. Thank you, all of you who have participated. Many of you have traveled long distances to join with us at this important launch. But of course, we could talk about our challenges. And what is our challenge as we leave this room? The challenge is for us to take the energy and hope we have here today, and I believe also in Paris at the simultaneous event, to move them, to move them, and also to move them from here to all of the other activities that we're going to take, that will take place. And all of the 70 events that are happening over the next couple of days around World Teachers' Day, to celebrate World Teachers' Day and to celebrate the launch of our uh, Unite for Quality Education. We want to build not a moment, but a movement. We must come together and move forward, united. And for those watching on the web today, we are counting on you too. Together, all of us, we unite for quality education. Let us do it. Thank you.